the handling of those is, you, you, are they handled more fragile than regular? No. They're pretty tough, uh, as long as you don't let them. I love these, uh, these parrot <coughs> tulips. You get $2 a stem on parrot tulips. They're a little bit more expensive. Yeah. This is flaming parrot. A fantastic, I mean, that, that thing, when it's open, it gets almost this big. And they're, they're just beautiful. They look like a Rembrandt painting. They're phenomenally expensive of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So by the, by the bulb, by the case, you're going to pay oh, maybe 65 cents, something like that. So there, there we are, the spring display with tulips. <coughs> And this is what we want our display to look like at the very beginning, is uh, all these beautiful tulips. You can also see that we, we grow hyacinths also in pots that are planted in the uh, fall and put in the cooler, a cooler that's not turned on in the wintertime, stacked up in crates, and then uh, after they've gotten enough chilling, we'll uh, start taking those out about three weeks before market, and they'll bloom for market. We get about $9 a piece for those pots of hyacinths. Okay, that's the tulips. So this is, we're still in sequence here in the springtime. We're still in April. We haven't even gotten to summer yet. Um, snapdragons are a really important crop because they're so popular, and they're not that hard to grow. The hardest part in snapdragons is getting them to germinate and getting the small plants, and you can buy them. Uh, we, we propagate most of ours, but we have, in the last couple of years, have had some germination problems, so we're buying also plugs. If you need to buy plants, uh, we're using Germania seed in Chicago. If you call them, and their number is on this resource sheet too, if you call them and tell them you need snapdragon plants that you want to plant uh, uh, in your greenhouse on whatever date it is, they'll tell you what's available. They'll also let you know how far in advance you need to order. But uh, <clears throat> we plant three sets of snapdragons. One is planted in late December, another in a heated uh, just a minimally heated greenhouse. The next planting is mid-February in an unheated house, and then two weeks later we plant another set. The, the ones that grow for the longest time before blooming in a heated house get the tallest. We grew snapdragons outside for years and years, and they only ever got about this tall. That was about it. These get this tall, and they have, they have stems about this size and they're worth a dollar a piece, uh, and you could probably even get more for them, but they're fantastic for just single stem bunching or for mixing with the lilies. Like you can see, we have lilies blooming there too. We grow, we grow. We start planting those lilies. I'll talk about lilies in a minute, but we start planting those lilies in, in January. We just started last week. But I'll, I'll propagate these things starting in early October in the greenhouse, seeded in those 288 trays. They're very tiny seed, and then, uh, um, they have to be watched very carefully for water, but they'll germinate within a couple of weeks, and they, then we transplant them to those 50-cell pots, 50-cell trays, and, or 72s, and by mid-December, we can plant these in these boxes. This is what they look like in the middle of April, right? Within the first two or three markets, we have snapdragons. These are all Potomacs. There's a lot of different series of, you know, snapdragons, greenhouse snapdragons come in these different series of um, varieties. Potomacs are popular, Liberty. There's, there's several different series from each breeder has its own series of snapdragons. But they also come in categories. These are three fours, and that means that's, that refers to the day length that they'll bloom in. Um, a one, two, or two, it's going to be something that blooms during a much shorter day length. But we like these Potomacs for blooming right when we need them at our farmer's market. That's what they look like. You can see these layers of netting. So we use this stuff called Horta Nova, which is a plastic netting that gets stretched out um, and, and uh, suspended on these four-foot rebar uh, posts that we've driven into the ground. And these snapdragons are so tall and get heavy, so we have to grow them through a couple layers of netting. The first layer of netting is going to be about two feet, and the next layer is going to be at about three and a half feet. And that'll keep them straight, because if you don't use this, they'll start to collapse. They get to a certain height, they start to fall over, and then the stems will start to bend, and it really messes up your crop. 
We use this type of netting on a lot of flowers. And there we are with uh, one of the crops. There are some, these are something else you have to be careful about aphids. Aphids love snapdragons, and so, but they are, uh, you can control them with safer soap. The snapdragons don't seem to mind the soap. We bought a, after years and years of using one of these pump, backpack pump sprayers, a solo, we finally went to a battery powered one which is awesome. <laughs> so uh, I can actually tolerate going and spraying with the battery powered one because I'm not having to pump all the time. But we have to be prepared to do that in here a couple times. Yeah? This netting doesn't strip off a lot of leaves when you, when you pull them through? No. I grab the, grab the top, cut under here, yeah. and pull it out, and then strip the leaves off. We do strip everything that's going to be below water level. Yeah. And here we are planting um, out in an unheated hoop house through landscape fabric. This is, this is the first uh, outdoor planting. <coughs> Snapdragons are very tolerant of cold. So I, my impression is they can take down to about 15 degrees as long as they have row cover over them. We had 12 degrees out there one time, and they got damaged. Some of them, most of them recovered, but we did a lot of replanting there. So I try to wait until it looks like we're going to have at least the high teens uh, bef before we plant outside in an unheated house. Now, they're going to be covered with row cover, but they're, they're really tolerant of cold. And these will come on about the beginning of June, right after the ones inside. So these are, you can see they're not quite as tall as the ones that are in the heated hoop house, but they get way taller than stuff that's outside. And you can get two sets of blooms off these. First, first bloom is going to have nice big stems, and then once you cut all those off, it'll start to come back, and you'll have smaller stems. They smell good. They smell kind of like bubble gum. People respond to this at market. Even if you only had a few and your, your rest of your display was all vegetables, they'll, they're like these. They'll come over and start looking around. And these come in great colors. These come in uh, white, yellow, orange, red, pink, some bicolors. OK, that's Snapdragons. We do three, three plantings. Lilies are something else that are fantastic. They require some investment. So this is what's prevented a lot of our competitors at the farmer's market from getting into lilies is the cost. We spend a lot of money on lilies. We grow uh, something over 10,000 of them every summer. We plant about 300 a week uh, starting in January and continuing until September. Um, they the nice thing about lilies is you can plant them and have them coming on from the succession planting that you're doing. And we try to have them from the very first market until the very end of our markets. These first ones, we try to get them timed so that they'll come on at Mother's Day. This is a, an, there, so there are two basic types of lilies that we grow. There are Asiatic lilies and the hybrids, and there are Oriental lilies and the hybrids. So Oriental lilies <coughs> are the fragrant ones. These are fragrant. They come mostly in pinks, some shading to red, and into the whites. And um, of course, these have been hybridized with trumpet lilies. So you can also get some yellows and white and yellows. We could also grow some of those. They're called OT hybrids. But this is a very valuable lily. And what we don't sell in pots for Mother's Day as people for gifts we'll just chop them off in the pot and sell them at market. So we actually sell a lot more of them chopped off in the pots. How many we in each pot? Pardon? Three. Three in a three-gallon pot. We sell those for about $15 for a pot of three lilies. This is the only time we grow lilies in pots is for the very earliest sales. We're also growing them in crates. So these Containers on the ground are what are called lily crates. They're, they're about this big, and they're about this deep, and they're made for commercial production of lilies. And they stack. We use them for everything now. We have so many of them. We use them for all our vegetable harvest, for taking to market. But uh, we started using them 
for lily production. You plant, um, we put two gallons of soil mix, which we make up in the bottom of the flat, in the bottom of the crate, and we put our lilies out. It'll take about 24 lilies per crate, and then we put four gallons on top of that. And very predictably within, all of these lilies are rated by how many weeks they are to bloom. So you've got a 10-week lily at about as early as you can get an Asiatic lily. Uh, an oriental lily might be 14 weeks. But um, these first ones that we were harvesting, that pink one is called Batistero, and these salmon color ones are called Salmon Classic. Those are some of the earliest lilies that we can get. So we start planting those in January to get the earliest blooms in April. By March and late March, we can hardly move around in here. We just built a special lily house because we can hardly move around in this greenhouse. We got so many lilies going on, including our transplants. But it's all very valuable. Those Asiatic lilies we're able to sell at the farmer's market for three dollars a stem. The Oriental lilies we sell for um, four dollars a stem, or three for ten dollars. And this is what you can do with them. So in this case, we've got these early salmon classic lilies in mid-April. We've got our snapdragons blooming in the greenhouse. We've still got some tulips left that are coming out of those stacks of refrigerated tulips that probably got harvested three weeks earlier. And we've still got some anemones in there, I think. So you start to have some pretty fantastic looking bouquets by end of April. And, you know, that bouquet easily go for 12 to $15. <coughs> we started out planting lilies in the hoop house, in the ground. Our first lily plantings were in the ground. And, uh, in fact, this first house, this $1,500 20 by 45 foot hoop house, one of the first ones we built, was paid for by that lily crop because those lilies sold for $3 a piece and you can plant 320 in each bed. So, and they, they're very dependable, but the reason we quit planting them in the hoop house is because they're sensitive to spring frosts. So they'll come up earlier in the, in the hoop house. Uh, you can plant them now and they start coming up early, but you can only protect so much in an unheated house. And if they freeze, they're no good, they're dead. The, the buds will freeze. We've had that happen to us in the spring and in the fall with full houses full of lilies, and it got too cold. So we learned the hard way about planting them in the ground. Now we plant them in containers, and we're able to take them out of the hoop house, put them up in the heated greenhouse to finish off. Um, but this particular crop we left in over the ground over the summer. We planted, we overplanted it with a celosia crop, and then we let it come back the, the next spring, and they were huge. That's one stem he's holding there. And if you plant oriental lilies outside, they get bigger and bigger and bigger every year. But if you're in an area like we are, where you're, you get late spring frosts, if your lilies are up and it frosts bad, you're in trouble. They're dead. The, the top freezes off. So we don't do outdoor production. There are also some, um, some diseases associated with lilies out in outdoor beds. There's a botrytis that gets on lily buds when it rains. And so if you have lilies that are over, uh, you're holding over for the next year or the next year. It might be fine for a bed that's up close to your house, but if you're doing production, I think I have a picture in here of some production beds. We started to get this botrytis on the buds and it progresses up the leaves and it gets spots on the buds and when the flowers open, they're all spotted. So now we only do indoor production in containers of lilies. And it's easy to do, you just have, but you do have to, the cost of the soil mix. So this is still, uh, this, is, this is probably May, early May. We've still got a few tulips left. This is later on in the summer. But the combination of all the tall spiky stuff like gladiolas and things like sunflowers, but the lilies with the fragrance um, and just the shape of them is fantastic. They give a really classic look to bouquets. Um, it's just a typical weekday harvest. Our crew is actually changes back and forth between two weeks on vegetables and two weeks on flowers. They change back and forth so they learn how to do everything. So this is what those crates look like in, in a hoop house. So in the middle of the summer, 
You cannot grow lilies exposed to full sun. They've got to be under shade cloth. So we have 30 to 50 percent shade cloth over, the, especially oriental lilies. If you plant orient, oriental lilies in a crate in the summertime and expose it to full sun, it'll bloom at about this high. And so you've got to grow them under shade. We found that out the hard way. And this is, uh, this is what our lily house looks like. So one of our hoop houses gets cycled into a lily house every summer. So you can tell the density of that planting. So we didn't even really, really have to have any agricultural land here. These are all in crates. And we've got thousands of lilies in there at the value that they have, protected from the weather, watered. Um, we're actually still watering by hand. You can set this up on drip if you want to. But in a fairly small area, you can grow thousands of dollars worth of lilies. If, as long as you're willing to make the investment and you have a market for them. The main thing is you have a market for them. Here's how we used to grow them outside. But like I said, there are some disease issues in rainy periods. But if you didn't have any, if you didn't have a facility for growing them, you know, I'd try some outside. In the first year, it's not so bad. It's when you have the, the fallen leaves and everything that are persistent until the next year, you start to have that buildup of botrytis. So our, uh, our cooler is generally full of lilies in the summertime. Uh, we have to harvest every harvest day, three times a week we're harvesting lilies. We harvest when there's one bud open on the stem. They go into a floral solution and uh, we can hold them for as long as we want to. They can hold up to two weeks. We have the containers are dated. And lilies are something that we can grow um, way up late into fall. So these, these lilies were actually planted in August and they're blooming in October after everything outside is dead. We actually still have lilies in the greenhouse now. All right, that's lilies. <laughs> Lysianthus, real important, especially if you have a hoop house. Yeah? I have a question. What is the floral solution? Floralife. Do you know what floralife is? It's a powder that's made up of a sugar and um, something like a chlorine compound to kill bacteria. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is it organic? It's not organic. <laughs> and our, um, our certifier is not concerned with our using floral life on our flowers. So they're basically looking at all our vegetable production. I think it would be possible if you really wanted to come up with a, a basically floral solutions are an acidifier uh, like citric acid, a sugar to help flower development, and something to kill bacteria. So if you really wanted to experiment, you could probably come up with a citric acid, sugar, and chlorine solution as long as it was dilute enough that uh, would take care of, do what you wanted it to.